Uh, today is December 7th, 9... <laughs> Oral Histories. Uh, December 7th, 2017, and today I'm here with... David Cope. So, let's start with your early life. Uh, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in San Francisco, but only spent uh, six months there. I was a blue baby and um, wasn't given much chance to survive, but I found that out later. And so we, we moved immediately to L.A. Uh, and um, then uh, I was told that I, that wasn't very good for me either. My asthma was just horrific. And so we had to move to a much drier climate, which was um, Phoenix, Arizona. And this was in 1945, 46, right around there. And uh, <clears throat> spent, uh, went to Arizona State University. So I spent my, my early years through uh, 22 there. Oh, wow. OK. And what did your parents do? Uh, my father was a um, was an accountant for a tractor company. My mother was a piano teacher. Oh wow, that that might explain some things. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it might. So, as a kid, did you read a lot of science fiction? Yes, I read a lot of, a lot of science too with George Gamow mostly as my great hero in life. He wrote a, a large number of books that. Are on, on really important issues, and I, I enjoyed reading those. And then I, I was an Asimov fan and a Clark fan and a Bradbury, you know that. <laughs> uh, I think one of my, uh, well, obviously Philip was a farmer, and uh, beyond that, um, uh, that uh, Frederick Brown. Arena, great story. <laughs> yeah, and I loved What Mad Universe. Oh, yeah. That is a classic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I have, thanks to a very dear friend, I think five, five different copies or publications of that book. Oh, wow. Made in the uh, 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Great. And did, did you think <coughs> that had an effect on you as you, as you grew up? Well, yes. I mean, I, I was um, a very serious <laughs> amateur astronomer and built telescopes, radio and, and visual uh, through much of my youth. I was very, uh, very fond of, uh, of um, building, uh, you know, radios and so forth. And uh, I think probably had one of the first radio telescopes, functioning radio telescopes in Arizona. Wow. At the age of 15, back in 1956, it wasn't a popular item in the state at that particular time to do that. And I had one with an antenna on my roof of my parents' house. And that, that brought a lot of questions from neighbors, <laughs> as you might imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when did you start studying music? Oh, as soon as I could uh, sit on a piano chair. I mean, sit, sit on a bench, a proper bench, and raise my hands up to the keyboard. I was probably two and a half. Wow. And my mother was my first teacher. And so uh, that your first instrument then would have been the piano. Did you study a lot of, a lot of different instruments? No. I mean, about the only thing I was doing at the time besides uh, studying instruments, well, one instrument, piano, was my parents had a bunch of 78s. And I used to, you know, I really got used to to that. A funny story about that is the fact that, you know, they had to, the 78s were such that they wouldn't have a whole piece of classical music. So I remember the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, and it would, it would stop about, you know, a third of the way through the first movement and click down on this automatic uh, system. And, and uh, I just, I listened to it so often. But I assumed that was part of the performance. And, and when I, I didn't know that, and when I went to the f first live performance, I was very critical because I thought, you know, they'd left out all these parts for the <laughs> who were changing. And um, yeah, uh, so I listened a lot, a great deal to music. And I was in love with, my, my parents had a, a good 78 record collection of classical music. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of uh, interesting, information about that and 
and an early love for it oh. there. And when did you start composing? I think I was seven. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't any good, but it was... <laughs> Well, you got to start somewhere. Yep. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. <clears throat> and so, uh, when did you first encounter a computer? Oh my God! It was a in nineteen, I think, probably just. Well, I mean, I encountered them in, in science fiction films all over the place, and in science fiction stories and novels. But aside from that, physically. Probably in 1975, an IBM mainframe at uh, Miami University of Miami, Ohio, Miami, Ohio, and um, <clears throat> and that's where. Really? And do you remember what you thought when you first saw it? No, I'd been pretty well prepared by science fiction and other things. I, I pretty much knew it was it's, it's going to be. You know, operated via uh, punch cards, and uh, and yeah, no, I, I I was surprised by the size. I don't know why. I guess because I saw it, I've seen Babbage's. I mean, I've seen photos of what he was working with, and it seemed, unless they were doing something funny with it, with the photographs, <clears throat> that it was. You know, I mean, his was much smaller and doing quite similar kinds of things, but. No, I, I wasn't surprised. Oh, wow. And was that the first computer you ever used, personally? You know, I don't know. I, it's the first one that I can remember actually using seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Fortran. What, oh, Fortran, of course. Uh, what, was, what were you using your computers for early on in your career? Composing. Just, just composing, excellent. That's the first thing that I, that I did. And so do you remember... <clears throat> uh, uh, you were working in Fortran. Do you remember what sort of, uh, pro were you writing programs or just operating other ones that already existed? No, I was most, mostly using random things and, and it was mostly dealing on paper with, uh, uh, with diagrams of how I was going to input the information and, you know, output the information to something that I could read and make a musical score from. Mm -hmm. It was a choral piece that was performed the year in the same year, mm -hmm. and it was just ghastly, just <laughs> ghastly. But what the hell? Yeah, what was it called? Uh, Hague Cope Com. Hague Cope Com. Okay. Uh, ha Summers Hagerman was a, a European who was studying at the time at Miami as a graduate student in computer science, and was somebody who was very much involved with the computer there. Um, and and uh, I got together and um, we worked on this thing. So Hague Cope Com is is summer is H A G from Hagerman, uh, C O P for Cope and uh, uh, what was the name of the piece again? Hague Cope Com. Computer. Yeah, makes sense. That's the end. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it was computer or composition. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be either one, but it was computer. Yeah. Um, it took two or three months to write. Oh, wow. How long was it? About eight minutes. Hmm. That's actually a fairly, fairly good size uh, thing for a 75. Yeah. It's for chorus. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. Which, and it may have been the chorus that made it sound so awful, but I don't know. They weren't very, they weren't very happy with having to do this, and... Uh, particularly when they discovered you know, its, its source. Mm -hmm. And had you been composing for electronic instruments before that? Uh, yes. Yes, a lot. Mm -hmm. But analog computers, oh, okay. uh, essentially. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. basically a Moog synthesizer, and uh, that was it. But I had done, yeah, I had done lots of things. Um, commercial backgrounds. I mean, it was in South... West Ohio, these kinds of things are are um, pretty unique at the, at the time. I mean, it was you know I was I was very busy going to various schools and so forth and taking the uh, the Moog with me and showing how it worked and then creating something on the spot for the students with a sequencer, oh, wow. which to me was more like a computer 
and it was a lot of fun. So I really, I took all those jobs, not because they paid much of anything, but but because it was fun to do. I mean, it really was. It was it was great fun. I learned more and more about the instrument that I was using, and the fact that it was an analog computer of sorts. I mean, it 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 really was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and uh, so, did you ever actually interact with Bob Moog? Uh, well, I I seen him. I I have seen him speak, but I have not I have not shaken his hand or said hello or anything. Uh, all I know is that I saw him. Apparently, this was one of his favorite things to do. So I don't think it. I think it was planned, where it didn't work mm -hmm. with the thing he was demonstrating. The Moog synthesizer he was demonstrating stopped working, and so he said, "I'll show you now how to fix these damn things." Wham! <laughs> <laughs> and it worked immediately. So I have a feeling it was staged uh, as part of his uh, ongoing act. Is he had quite a sense of humor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had some great uh, stories about that with Mark Mothersbaugh we got a couple weeks ago that were just wonderful. Um, what sort of challenges do electronics and computers present to a composer? Or is it just another instrument? Yeah, it's another instrument. Uh, I won't say just another instrument because a lot of people have are not interested in all the knobs and stuff, and they don't consider them particularly musical. So they they end up getting right quite confused, and and um, unless they have a teacher, they, they they really had problems in those days. Mm -hmm. And so there are not many people who want to do that. But but um, yeah, it's it's uh, in, in the right circumstances, it's just another instrument. Hmm. Excellent, and. And what were the sort of the first software pro or some of the early software programs that you were developing? Uh, what were they being used for? Or was it just generation and composition or uh, score score creation? Was it just the creation of tones or the creation of scores, of written scores and such? Yeah, mostly it was musically related and most of it was composition. Yeah. Uh, I didn't publish any of those early compositions because I didn't feel I, w I really knew what I was doing yet. But I, um, I liked it. I read a lot about it. And um, I fear I'm not answering your question. But uh, <laughs> at, at the moment, that I guess that answers the part of your question that was related to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you working with technologists or other uh, composers or or were you just on your own? I was on my own. I've oh. always been on my own, mm -hmm. uh, the tendency. I won't say that uh, in recent years, because I do have people now, and particularly uh, my friend who is here, <laughs> who uh, helped me think through some things. But nonetheless, I tend to work uh, on my own mm -hmm. a great deal. Ah. OK. We're going to transition a little bit into Emmy. OK. And so what, what are the origins of Emmy? Well, fundamentally, I had a composer's block, and I'll just state that like that. I mean, it's just like a writer's block. I couldn't figure out why C was any better than C sharp to start off with and where they were going or how they were moving. I just really, you know, I'd reached my, probably my mid-30s at that particular point, and I had a commission for an opera, and I'd already spent the commission uh, on my four sons uh, and wife and me, and uh, as a result of that, I, I um, needed to do something. And I, and I knew a lot of people in the AI department uh, at US, UCSC at that particular point. So I consulted with them, and they, they all came to the same agreeable kind of advice, which was essentially, why don't you, um, you know, since you can program, why don't you write a program that will create your music for you? I thought that was a very good idea. And so that's what I tried to do. And over a period of seven or eight years, I eventually did that. Oh, wow. OK. And so uh, you, did you start it once you got to U UCSC? Or was it, uh, was it already percolating at that point? No. I, I came to UCSC in 1977. And the the block didn't occur until 1980, three years after I'd been there. Oh, okay. But I had done a lot of work uh, in the uh, electronic laboratory there uh, at the university, and I was very happy to have that available to me. And it was made available by the uh, 
by the faculty and uh, staff there, wonderfully so. I mean, they were just terrific. And so I spent, you know, some time, as much time as I could possibly afford, working in the, uh, the technical aspects of things. And do you remember what hardware the initial versions were running on? Well, the actual, the actual computer that I used to write, not something by Emmy at that, at that point, but something that turned into Emmy was an Apple IIe, oh. of all things. And, um, and then, I mean, that took a great deal of time. And, um, uh, you know, and I mean, I work from a standpoint of data-driven, you know, work with a bunch of data, analyze it, and then produce a new piece, and in the style of the, of the music in the database. And that required getting a lot of that data into code. Mm -hmm. And um, in this case, it meant five parameters and their values for each and every single note of these compositions. And so it was before MIDI, um, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, MIDI, uh, which makes it much easier. So I had to put all those five, five parameters into every single note of a piece, and so I did the entire Bach 371 chorales, mm -hmm. uh, and um, most of Mozart's sonatas. Quite a, bit of, quite a bit of work was just that routine, get up in the morning and work, just like exercising, you know, I just do it. And, um, and it took years. And so, uh, do you see Emmy as a composer or as a composer's tool? Tool. Mm -hmm. There's nothing magical going on in there. It's basically addition. Hmm. And, and um, very simple arithmetic, not even, I mean, you can get beyond that by building you know, calculus and so forth into the program. But as far as the hardware is concerned, it's just simple binary you know, binary math. Oh, cool. And so, uh, as you've gone on, I know you were you're talking about sort of the uh, the search for style as a uh, as a thing. And how did that sort of come about? Well, I knew my opera had to be in my style. Uh, that that's why that's why I got the commission. So, somebody was curious about how um, you know th um, you know it would, would occur, or how a, a cope style opera would be like to listen to. And uh, so I uh, tried to figure out what style was and then realized there was like only two books in the entire library at that time that had anything to do with musical style and neither one of them really had anything to do with musical style. They just said things like broke music at strills, right? And they had these instruments they played on, but nothing about the musical inherent style. And I, and I knew that I had a, a problem to face. What was the style of music? I eventually didn't face it, uh, essentially, because, I, because Emmy works on a basis of having a lot of data to work from, the styles and the data. So I, you know, I, I've never really learned uh, a great deal about at least historical styles and my own style um, that I'd like to learn still. So I will probably continue, as I have over the past, whenever I had a spare moment, which isn't often, uh, and, and uh, work with style in that way. I'd like to go back, could I, to your question about, um, oh God, the one before this one, mm -hmm. had, to, had to do with is, is, it, is a computer a tool or not? Yeah. Yeah, I envision a time in which, even though I'm not a futurist, uh, I envision a time when it will be not be a tool, but I have yet to find a, a, um, anything that what my computer does uh, isn't programmed by a human being. It's a, it's a tool. It's a really, really, really sophisticated shovel. And I, I, the reason I go, I'm going, is taking this little extra time here on this is because I often get questions about how, you know, computers write the music. Well, they really don't. I mean, they're just like a, 
a slide rule. I mean, I, that, this is an early example of a computer that's not electronic. And um, uh, it's, it's a tool that we use. And so the music that comes out is, is, uh, is, is a combination of my interpretation, I suppose, of the data that's in the database and that data is by other human beings. So there's really nothing, nothing about it that's not a tool that I know of right now. AI and, and all of the deep learning and so forth is, is fun to talk about, but I still think it's a tool. Even though we don't quite know what's going on in there, that doesn't make it less a tool. Cool, actually that's a great, that's a great segue to the next step. Oh good. <laughs> um, so, this is going to be about sort of reactions to Emmy. Uh -huh. And so the first one is, what was the reaction of you to the works that they were putting out that Emmy was, was composing? Well, I had, I had, you know, I've got to be honest with you. I've, I wrote a number of Emmys, oh. all of which failed. And when I finally figured out the combination that would actually work, that is data-based rather than rule-based, I... Um, I suffered uh, through some bad, rather bad times there. And then w when the first composition, the Mozart Sonata Movement, came out, I was uh, floored. It, it went from, you know, it's one of those situations where I'm sure we're all, all of us in this room right now would be aware of in the sense that, you know, sometimes it gets worse before it finally just clicks into place. And so it just got worse and worse and worse, and so I was just feeling depressed and not getting anything out of the, the program. And all of a sudden, it was just exactly right, and I couldn't believe it. It was, a, it was one of those really true aha moments in which I actually felt that maybe it was playing a, a, <laughs> one of the real Mozart sonatas. I just couldn't believe this was something new that I had not heard before, oh. but it was. And what was the reaction of the sort of the the field, the field of mu the music establishment to what uh, Emmy was putting out. Well, we should also include the scientific uh, aspect of it, but then the I was one. very much involved. So I'll take them both at the same time because cool. they, they, they were completely and diametrically op opposed to one another. Yeah, the musical one was, was, you know, where's the soul? What are you doing? Trying to put us all, all out of work, et cetera, et cetera. The scientific community was just am amazingly um, happy with, with the results and uh, wanting to know how I did it and uh, ended up, you know, uh, with a lot of book contracts and so forth. And, and uh, that was really, you know, uh, really satisfying. And so uh, was it difficult to get uh, works done by Emmy uh, published? Oh, impossible. <laughs> Completely impossible. And recorded. Mm -hmm. I went through more than 100 recording companies before a, a particular company, which I'll actually name here, Centaur Records, mm -hmm. uh, would actually say yes. Mm -hmm. And they did. And I published quite a few CDs with them. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was an amazing moment. I, I you know, can remember the exact timing when it came in the mail that he said, yes, I'd be happy to do this. It sounds like it'd be really be fun. But everybody else's view was, you know, good God, no. And in fact, one little uh, story here is, is about, uh, I think it was on the same day or neighboring days that I received a, um, a letter of rejection from a company who, who, compo who, who published in their, on their CDs recordings of um, of new music, saying that uh, no, they would not release that album because it was not new music; it was old musical styles. The fact that it was composed by a computer is not not germane to the issue here. The following day, or the same day, whatever, I can't remember exactly the order in which they came in, was from a company who produced classical music of composers who've 
long been dead or at least smelled that way. Um, you're supposed to laugh at that moment, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they said no because this music was composed presently. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting those two really close to one another and feeling like, well, if that's the case, then there is really no way to do this. If both sides say no for what seemed to them to be really, really good reasons, I'm, I'm in, uh, you know. And I, I wasn't going to send any more, you know, requests out, but my request had already been sent, so I sent them in bunches to Centaur, and, and so Centaur didn't know about this, and, and therefore uh, they accepted. Oh, nice. Um, now, has there ever been a composer who Emmy just can't seem to compose in their style. Well, uh, Beethoven was the first one that I encountered at the staff. And, it's, and the reason is obvious, that, the, that Beethoven doesn't have uh, the same kind of a style that, that uh, Mozart did when he composed 41 plus symphonies, where Beethoven only composed nine plus a half. Uh, and, and of those nine, they're all very, very different and unique. And, and therefore, it's, it's uh, difficult uh, to, um, to pin down a style. I mean, certainly there's a style there, but uh, there's so little, that's it. There's so little information. There's so little uh, of much of a database. You, you put one sonata in, you put the next sonata in, and you've got to put five more because those two are different from each other in very, in very uh, obvious ways if you listen to them. So. Uh, it's, it's the more the better. I mean, basically Chopin mazurkas, of which there are 56, and they're all in the same style. That's great. That's perfect. Uh, but if you're going to take um, The Planets by Gustav Holst, for example, there's no way to go. I mean, they, there's only one of them, and there's not, none of the rest of his works are anything like that particular one. So you put that in the database, you're going to get out something that pretty much sounds like that, that data. Mm -hmm. And people will say, well, God, that's, that's a loser. It's the same thing. Yeah. And do you think there is, a, uh, there is a composer who is best suited towards Emmy? Is it Chopin or one of the... I know oh, it's Bach. Mm -hmm. Bach is, I think, the Bach is the... Yeah. I mean, if you, if you try to do the seventh Brandenburg Concerto, which I and Emmy did... Uh, it's a problem because there's only six there, so that was a tough one. But the, you know, I, I use for examples often Bach chorales because there's there's over 400 of them, mm -hmm. and they're all in the same style. I mean, they're all very much Lutheran chorale style of the time, and uh, therefore it's um, it's chicken feed, I and mean, it's really easy to do. Mm -hmm. And have you ever worked with non-Western music? Yes. Oh, any any particular uh, styles? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Balinese gamelan style. Oh wow. And uh, yeah, some of it's recorded. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to go on to some other pr projects now. Okay. Um, although Emmy will sneak back in a couple times. Um, can you talk about some of the other composers and technologists you might have encountered in your travels? Who sort of did anyone sort of have an influence on bringing you, you know, onward and forward? In terms of? In terms of, well, let's start actually with, in terms of music. In general? Of, yeah, in general. In my life? Yeah. Sure, but there's so many of them that I couldn't even begin to, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, Messiaen, for example, uh, was an influence when I first met him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite uh, an extraordinary event for me. Ludoslavsky, these are European composers for the mm -hmm. most part. Uh, Cage, at length. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, good grief, uh, Jerry Hiller, Lajaran Hiller. Uh, but I'm, even though he's been dead for quite some time, uh, I guess I'm allowed to say Jerry <laughs> since we were... Not close, but, but certainly friends, there's no question. Um, how many composers do you want? Actually, that's a great, that's a great place to sort of, uh, uh, Hiller, 
uh, what sort of interactions did you have? Was it just, uh, you know, you happened to be running in the same circle or did you sort of have a, an information No, exchange? I didn't run in circles. Well, I may have run in circles for a while <laughs> when building Emmy, but, but uh, I didn't mean we didn't run in the same, uh, in the, in the same categories. Uh, that's not a good word to use. Uh, run in the same circles. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Okay. So, uh, but no, I, I, uh, I knew of a very famous work called uh, HPSCHD. Was that how it's mm -hmm. spelled? Yep. I think so. Uh, with him and Cage and, uh, and his appearance in uh, the magazine that you have copies to. Source. Huh? Source. Source, Source music, of the music of the avant garde. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had a, a piece in there together, and uh, I knew both of them. And um, now I have forgotten what the question was <laughs> um, about how you encountered and what sort of interaction you had with, uh, with Jerry Hiller. Oh, with Jerry Hiller himself. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I immediately wanted to do one of Jerry Hiller record. I was a, it was a head of a very small recording company at the time. This was very early on, 78, 79, maybe 80, somewhere in there. And so I spoke to him on the telephone often, and then we'd go to the same conferences, and I'd see him there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'd talk about, uh, yeah, we'd talk about some things. It, it wasn't a you know, a great friendship, although I thought he was a really nice guy, and he was, but, um, you know, yeah, he was, he was um, I don't know if he was an influence on me, but I, you know, his book from the 19, God, 1960, mm -hmm. would that be right? Experimental 60. music was so early on that it's just, it still amazes me that it was written because it was only Zanakis and he, really, although there were a couple other Europeans that were doing this kind of thing. And of course, Cage was doing everything. <laughs> and how, how'd you know Cage? What was that? Was well, that I, I brought him. Uh, one of the first things I decided to do when I came to this campus was to, was it not start a series so much, but, but actually uh, get as many people as I could on campus to do uh, their shtick. Mm -hmm. to do what they, you know, did in real life. And so, luckily enough, we had San Francisco to sort of, you know, and, and uh, Karma, uh, Sinmet wasn't around then, but Karma at Stanford was, and they'd bring people in, and we'd sort of hitch a ride on them and ask them if they'd come down for, you know, one-tenth the cost, mm -hmm. and I got them here. And so we had lots and lots of people for the first two or three years coming in, and that was uh, a lot of fun. And... Uh, yeah. Excellent. And uh, let's see, so when you first got into the field, what was the computer music field like? Well, when I arrived on, at UCSC, that, I mean, that first year, it was just an amazing sequence of events that I couldn't possibly even portray to you <laughs> at the time. I mean, I was down at Carl Fravel's house and we were making circuitries, you know, building instruments with the circuits. And so I was soldering away and uh, having just enormous fun putting loudspeakers on things and writing compositions for these little miniature devices. I was going to Stanford for their summer workshop at very early, I think it was the second one, mm -hmm. or maybe the first one, I don't know exactly. I mean. Uh, John Chowning again actually gave me, showed me the list, actually gave me the list of the people who were attending at that time. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was so it was physically um, uh, computer like. I met students. I mean, the, the, the school, UCSC, was amazingly different than the schools that I had attended previously, which were very formal and Thai and the whole thing. UCSC at the time, and probably still is to a degree, maybe less so a little bit, but certainly to a degree uh, for, uh, informal. I mean, it was just 
everybody, you know, the students all called us by first names, the professors and so forth. And the, the yeah, it was, it was just great. Uh, they have all the electronic stuff available to me at the university. Um, to be able to communicate and work with people who uh, I read about in writing my books, uh, particularly New Directions in Music, um, for so long but never had a chance to meet. They were either here or coming down from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, Phlegm had already taken place a while back. That was the first, God, Phlegm, F, Phlegm, F-L-E-M-M, -E what is it? First live electronic music concert. I don't know how I got that name, but we got Phlegm in there too. Uh, and Phlegm was a, I mean, it was just madness. And it was, it, it, I think it took place while I was here for the interview. Uh, but even the interview that I had for the job was, was strange. I mean, to be honest, they wanted me. And I didn't know that, so I came here and tried to treat it as any kind of interview I had for a job, because frankly, I wanted out of Ohio. Not so much because of the school being bad, because I was the only composer there, and mm -hmm. I was in charge of the electronic music studio, and everything was great, but because it was Ohio, <laughs> which next to Indiana, which is next to all these Midwestern states who <laughs> vote for people like the current president. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this, th that first year was, was amazing. I mean, I had, a, I had a student who was very, very gifted. He wasn't a college student. He hadn't even gone to college, I don't think. Uh, but he was of that age. And he knew like five different programming languages of the time. And uh, he wanted to have composition lessons. So we just exchanged lessons. We'd meet once a week and an hour for me and an hour for him. I mean, it's just that much. I never heard of such a thing. But it seemed reasonable to me. So he taught me a couple of languages beyond Fortran, which was, I think, already at the time going out of style. And, and, uh, and um, I taught him how to write a fugue. Wow. And I still know him. He's, he's relatively strong in his field. And uh, which is uh, live electronic music with computers, I should say live computer music, mm -hmm. improvisational kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scott Lancaster is his name. Oh, yeah, pretty. You know Scott? Yeah, pretty well known, actually. I yeah. think I just heard a piece of his on uh, uh, Relevant Tones. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, well, he's, he's a great guy, and I've known him since he was that student who came to, to visit me and asked me the question, could I teach him if he'd teach me? Wow. I said, what the hell, why not? Yeah, well that's great. Um, and when So I'm his student, <laughs> as much as he is of mine. That's true, it's, a, it's not a mentor-mentee relationship, it's a ment relationship. Yes, a ment, <laughs> a cement <laughs> relationship. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, now, when did your workshops sort of begin, and what was the sort of the evolution of that? Oh, well, I, I thought that what the workshop that John Chowning ran here at, well, here across the bay, no, we're on the same side, up, up, the, up, up this uh, peninsula at Stanford was a fantastic thing. I mean, it was just great. I mean, good God. We started off, you know, coming at 9 o'clock in the morning and ending up finishing at 5 in the afternoon for, you know, 14 straight days. Uh, and... Uh, Within two or three days, we were working starting at one in the morning and working till about 11 in the morning so we wouldn't bother the... This was in an old, an old half donut shaped AI building up in the mountains on Page Mill or on a road off of Page Mill. And, uh, you know, it was just simply amazing. And so I, I felt that something like that al along those lines with algorithmic composition with computers would be something that I would really like to be uh, doing so, I created it. I found uh, an administrator uh, who would take care of the dirty work uh, and the clean work, I suppose, uh, but didn't teach in the workshop and really didn't have that much acquaintance with the subject. But 
seemed like he let, enjoyed working with me. And um, we put it together. And it lasted for 14 years. This is if, you know, this last summer was the first time it didn't happen. Hmm. And uh, were, there, were there any sig sort of significant people, you think, who went through those workshops that really, really went forward with what they were doing? Well, I, I, think, I think it's hard to say at this time because uh, a lot of the people who, who I, I would say, even though we had a, an age range from, you know, 19 to uh, 75 or something like that, most of the weight, most of the numbers of people were down in the lower echelon. We'd usually get one or two in the upper age, and they were faculty members someplace, and they were doing it just to see what it was about. Um, and um, so it was mostly younger people. So even those people now are still, you know, in their early to mid 30s, uh, since they were going to college at the time. And it's it's hard to imagine somebody being, uh, you know, quote big time at that stage. Though certainly uh, VJ, for example, I don't remember his last name, uh, has published a number of books which have become very very popular and very much used in both classrooms and of interested people having to do with computer composition and other things. So yes, there, there, there have been um, people who've done that, but um, you know, I think you won't, you won't notice their names uh, so much for another even another 20 years. Yeah, I know the, uh, the new Google Music Generation program that they're doing, a couple of them uh, mentioned that they had taken the workshop two really? years ago, and uh, was like, and I didn't get a chance to talk to them afterward. <laughs> oh, too bad. But yeah, I would have, I would have loved to have known that. Yeah. Um, okay. I well, didn't know that. They haven't even told me. <laughs> this oh. is magenta you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And which sounds really interesting. I just want to see what they pull off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sorcerer? Well, Sorcerer is the reverse of Emmy, essentially. Emmy goes down into the music and comes out with the style of the music in a new composition with a, with a form that's similar to the forms inside, et cetera. Uh, sorcerer is, is a um, kind of a, uh, a program that in which you put a target composition and then a database of music that you think that the target composition's composer might have been listening to prior to or during the composition that's there. Mm -hmm. And that would, you know, what you come out with is a diagram of possible uh, yeah. connections to those pieces. Oh, wow. And, and uh, it works really good. And it, it came about as a result of the fact that uh, during one composing run of a piece by Beethoven, this is before Sorcerer, only with Emmy, uh, as I was trying to get the, the, the whole thing to work with Beethoven, mm -hmm. which I did for a long time. Uh, and it came out and I said, you know, that sounds so familiar. It's probably one of Beethoven's other pieces. And I looked it up and I discovered that the, discovered, I, I should have remembered, but I, I use the word discover because I think I really did discover it. I'd forgotten that the database was entirely Mozart. And it came out just about, and this was one phrase, came out about two notes shy of being identical to the Beethoven piece that came out of Mozart entirely. And, you know, that got me thinking seriously about the Picasso and Stravinsky discussion about, you know, Stravinsky said what? Uh, good composers borrow and great composers steal. Mm -hmm. And Picasso was mad at Stravinsky, they were close friends, because he said, Stravinsky borrowed that from me. That's the little quip that goes on. And um, I realized it was damn true. So it was kind of one of those moments, those, again, aha moments when you realize that, and I've said this many times in public, so certainly it doesn't 
bother me to say it here, that that's what we do. We borrow and steal music from other, other composers. And what makes a good composer or a great composer, good or great, is how much of the original music that we've stolen things from or borrowed things from, uh, how much of it in, in contiguous form sounds like the original. I mean, if it's little bitty pieces. We don't actually recognize them very much in the context of a, of a larger composition. But if they're not, then we've, we've, you know, we're just getting away with murder. Uh, it sounds like a quote, and, you know, and it's, um, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, and what's gratis or greatest? I can never gratis. Say. Gratis, okay. It's, it's from, the, it's from a, a, a book written in the, in the distant past called Gratis Ad Bernasum. Uh, and it's, this is the first attempt to have me write a program that actually learns things on its own. Not that Emmy doesn't do it to a certain degree or any of my other programs, but Gratis does it entirely. Gratis, you give it, uh, you know, two or three examples of some, you know, well, essentially, let me say this to start off with. Uh, writing two-part two counterpoint according to style, historical, to a particular historical style, is very difficult to do. What you do is you get a cantus firmus, so one of the lines is already written, and the second line you have to write to, f to finish that. And there are highly restrictive rules on how you can write that line. So what you usually do is go, oops. Now how far do I have to go back before I can make a change and go the other direction and go like, oops. And so students actually you know, can spend a whole night trying to get one of these two-part things of only three or four measures mm -hmm. to work because there's all kinds of different places this can go, but the rules prohibit certain, you know, most of the actions you could possibly take. And so what, what basically Gratis does is learn how to do this during the first writing of one, and then you give it another one and just writes it right off. And, and it, it's great. And I, you know, I thought my students would, when I showed them how it worked, the students in a counterpoint class, of all things, that they would just simply go ahead and, and uh, grab the code from my website uh, and uh, compile it, run it, and get their assignments done just like that. Not one of them ever did. <laughs> they were too afraid of the computer in, in, in those days. I guess, or you know, too afraid of comp you know computational languages, mm -hmm. and they'd have to know something about it, which they didn't any more than I did. But they just did not go there ever. I even told them, "Here it is. Download it. Just do this, and run it, and then you just have to copy down the results. It's already trained on what you want to know." Luckily, I downloaded it for the museum the other day. Oh, good. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to move into Emily Howell. Emily Howell. And so can you describe sort of what led to Emily? Sure. It's very easy. I mean, I basically, uh, by the time 2003, 2004 rolled around, I was so sick and tired of having people uh, ask me for, you know, the, has the program finished uh, Schubert's Unfinished Symphony? And you can just imagine there's so many unfinished works, Beethoven's 10th, Mahler's 10th, et cetera, et cetera, that it, it, it's, it's simply uh, a field day if you like doing that sort of thing. But I had different, different dreams when I was growing up and different dreams after I retired to spend my time than simply you know, fulfilling these non-paying jobs. Uh, and, and not having him perform, because performers were still very fearful of it. And so I didn't, I decided I, I just had to, had to stop this. I didn't want to destroy the program, so I destroyed the databases instead. Not all of them, a couple of them I retained for, uh, for you know, demonstrations of, of the program and how it works, et cetera. Uh, 
During that time, I mean, I actually thought of doing this in the 90s, but I didn't, and I kept putting it off. And finally, in, again, 2003 or four, probably just around the curve of the year uh, there, I, I discovered that I had to do it, and I was going to build Emily Howell instead. Now, Emily Howell is a program that uh, is, unlike Emmy, interactive with the user and is able to communicate to you musically as well as linguistically. doesn't matter what language. You can just make up one if you wish. Um, but it, it learns it on its own, and it has an association network um, as its base, which I can describe later on in detail if you want, but it's, I don't think it would be very interesting to people to hear. Uh, more interesting to see, I guess. Uh, but... Um, yeah, uh, essentially the point of Emily Howell was to create uh, new music, the exact opposite of, of, uh, of Emmy. Uh, and so Emily Howell uh, tries to create music in a new style. And its data is Emmy's output. All of Emmy's output that I have agreed to can be heard because there are certainly pieces that failed. I didn't include those and that, therefore, the results would be kind of combinations of styles that were, you remember I was talking about that when I was talking about uh, you know, borrowing and stealing, that, in fact, is the amount of information. So you want little, to steal little bitty things, stitch them together, and you get something really new that way, where the listener cannot you know, hear enough of anything of the past our past composer's work to be able to identify its influence on the particular piece that you're having the, the program write for you. And so Emily Howell has been doing well. People often get uh, the two mixed up, but thankfully you did not, <laughs> and that's great. That's super. Yeah, and so what, what is the relationship between the user and the program? How does that sort of, that interaction between them work? Okay, well you start Typically, it doesn't have to be this way, but you typically start by, uh, by creating some kind of a, a, uh, an interface that is built on language. That is, the, you ask a question or you make a statement, and the program does, in essence, what you sort of want it to do. Now, that takes usually a day or so of almost you know, constant programming, not programming constant input, output, input, output, to get a, you know, to get the program even to recognize its own name, no less uh, your name and, and uh, what you're talking about. But during that time, you, you get a kind of a rapport set up. So the following day, you can spend on music. And, and so what happens is you, you, uh, you just treat the music like a language. So you, you, uh, you know, keep your particular language, spoken language, uh, involved in the, uh, in the process, and you add in the music. And then as you work with the machine, you uh, simply uh, listen to what its output is as the result of your input of small fragments, very tiny fragments. You listen very carefully to what it produces, and then either grant it permission to continue or deny it permission to continue. Unfortunately, I decided that I was going to make those denials and agreements uh, not, uh, shall I say, finite, not, not, not absolute. They're just little hints. Don't do that again. It might do it again the next time because of the weightings that are involved in the association that it may not, in fact, actually follow your instructions initially, but it will eventually. And in so doing, it also involves changes in the entire network about what things mean. And you can say, yes, I love that, Emily Howell, or no, start fresh, or if you get programming for a couple of weeks, not programming again, I'm using that word uh, incorrectly, um, inputting, no's and yeses, the program will, in fact, adhere to your comments and make an attempt. And you can say, no, I don't want that there. And it'll be removed either 
once or twice, depending on how many times you have to convince it to do that. And uh, so you're, 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 it's, it's, um, you know, how shall I say? It's a, it's a conversation. You're talking to yourself, right? But it's yourself that you've forgotten all the uh, inputs and outputs you've made over the last two or three days. Mm -hmm. And so in the process, you get, you know, you can get pretty confused. So you, I don't treat it as a version of myself. I treat it as a version of Emily Howell, which gets actually kind of confusing or less confusing than intimidating at times because, I mean, there's times that late at night when I work with that or when I have worked at it where I actually start talking to Emily Howell as if she were really Emily mm -hmm. Howell. The name comes from the fact that Emily and Emmy are, are not so distant relatives to each other, and the Howell is my middle name, the name of my uh, computer account at UCSC, uh, and my password, not my password, my my uh, email connection. And um, yeah, I think I've pretty much covered, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. I really talked too long that time. Now here's a philosophical question. Oh, good. Um, in the interactions between uh, Emily Howell and the user, which, has anyone else actually done deep scale work with Emily Howell? Not deep, no. No, mm. because it's, it's extremely time consuming. <laughs> But yes, short ones, I've had people do it all over the place. I've had mm -hmm. students in my class use it, and there typically were, uh, I don't know, 100 people in my, in my class when I was teaching it who used it. They all got the code. They all supposedly used it. I'm sure there were some who didn't, but <laughs> they did, and they had the fun or agony of this uh, themselves. So it's been used by lots and lots of people. Uh, and the source code's available for anybody who wants to uh, download it. Mm, nice. And so do you see the relationship between the user and Emily Howell as a mentor-mentee or as a artist-critic? Of, of, of those choices, I would take the first. Okay. Absolutely, um, over the second. Uh, Again, the machine is still very, very much of a tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I was hoping you would say. <laughs> it reaffirms <Good>. my beliefs. <laughs> Good. Um, all right, so let's go to uh, some of the other work you've done. Um, when did you become interested in the visual arts? I think I was eight. I wasn't interested in it, frankly. <laughs> but my mother and father said that I was, so I guess I was. <laughs> So I was sent to Arizona School of Art, oh. whose fame was built on the fact that every Halloween, the letters on top of the building were all on little runners. So we moved the F on of over <laughs> to the A-R-T. It doesn't sound like much, but for us it was a thrill because it was a rather, you know. So I spent seven years there every Saturday morning oh, wow. um, painting and uh, oil painting and watercolor and, uh, oh my God, uh, from all kinds of, uh, you know, pottery creation, mm -hmm. etc. No nudes though, and I couldn't understand why we didn't have some nudes to work from. I guess it was because I was eight. <laughs> Maybe, I suppose, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so when did you start working with uh, computer-generated visual art? Oh, I, I waited until I knew what I was doing. I didn't, I had no commission to have to pay back because I couldn't finish the opera. So I, by the way, I did finish the opera uh, in about, I don't know, less than a day <laughs> using, uh, using Emmy. But that was about eight, nine years later. Mm -hmm. Got the greatest reviews of my entire career. Oh, wow. Which made me think. <laughs> what was it called? Uh, uh, it was called... Uh, God, this is embarrassing. Yeah, I should remember I... Cradle Rocking. Cradle Rocking, okay. Yeah. Yes, that's been recorded, if I'm correct. Uh, if it has, I, I was not privy mm. to it. Okay. Mm. But 
they could very well have. Uh, what was what were, <laughs> um, so? When did you start doing uh, visual art generation? Okay, yeah, probably. I started probably in about two thousand seven, mm -hmm. but I didn't consider anything that came out of it uh, successful uh, in my terms until maybe mm -hmm. two thousand twelve, something like that. And since that time, it's done more than 500 paintings and uh, 20 books uh, available on Amazon called Ars in Genero, Generated Art in Latin. That makes so much sense. It does. <laughs> and so uh, what do you think was the limitation holding back your program from actually generating good visual art? Well, it was me. I mean, essentially, I, I couldn't get exactly the handle on the subject as I wanted. Uh, I, I had different ways of going about doing it, uh, and uh, they were mostly unsuccessful, very primitive, very simplistic, uh, and not very consoling, uh, or, in, in, you know, they didn't impress me at all. Uh, until I discovered some things. I, well, part of it was just discovering, um, you know, basically thoroughly how, how, how the screen works on a Macintosh <laughs> and, and uh, what RGB stands for and uh, a variety of things. Understanding some math, particularly nonlinear math. And yeah, I, a lot of things had to come together and it was, it, it was the same process as I went through with Emmy, which was just trial and error, and most of the time screwing it up uh, for the first f three or four years. And then finally, you know, I took a walk, which is what I generally do, and I take a long, 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 long walk and think it through and stop trying to fill myself full of information that other people have used and try to think of my you know, of what would work. All I want is, you know, nothing, art. And I wanted the art to be very, very, very high quality in terms of uh, output. So it's 15,000 DPI by 15,000 DPI, which is pretty, That's beefy. pretty good, <laughs> yeah. So you could make it, you know, large and not see, even with a magnifying glass, not see pixels. Uh, and I wanted that. Uh, so those were sort of the outer limits of what I was able to do. The rest of the time was, was trying to figure out how I could take uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope, winding our way back to the beginning of our conversation about astronomy, and uh, high level, high, high quality, high grade uh, images, and uh, you know, somehow turning the uh, the nonlinear math with the uh, RGB from you know the color photographs, because mm -hmm. nonlinear bat math is you either color it, you know, just fake color it yourself, or it get I mean, it, you know, or it's going to stay black and white or whatever. Uh, so I I use the the color from the images of the uh, of NASA uh, and uh, stuffed them together in ways and decided that what was coming out was was pretty interesting. Uh, interesting enough to put on my uh, front room walls <laughs> of my house and uh, sooner or later, um, having sold quite a few pieces now uh, for not great amounts of money. I'm not expecting to make a lot of money from it. But I'd like to be known as a professional rather than that. So even a penny would, would probably do it. <laughs> because all I have to do is give them something that didn't cost me anything in the first place except for the software, which was uh, you know essentially uh, stuff I've retrieved on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, like the NASA photographs. Yeah. Does that answer mm -hmm. your question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, did you see it as fundamentally harder to do 
visual art generation than music? Yes. But the other one's the hardest of all. Is the writing? Yeah. Yeah. So when did you get interested in, well, first, when did you get interested in just writing and storytelling sort of things? Oh, I was that again since my youth. I, I wrote a novel before I was 18. I wrote an epic poem before then. I was just, I loved short stories. And, um, and then I got out of it. And I wrote, think I wrote one novel throughout my entire creation. And it was terrible, just terrible. I destroyed it, and I will destroy it again if I find it anyplace else. <laughs> Mimeographed or Xeroxed or whatever. Um, it was just terrible. And then when I, when I started, I started, I started writing myself so I really knew what I was up against. And so I wrote 25 novels over a period of maybe five years or so. And I'm still, you know, they started off terrible. Uh, not terrible. Uh, they were written poorly. Mm -hmm. They were good books in terms of plot and so forth, I think. Only good, but they were good, I think. But, you know, the writing was bad, so I'm learning. And so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly rewriting those books. Mm -hmm. You know, last night I was up late, you know, working on one of the books and just rewriting it. Uh, so I can understand this process really, really intimately and well. And I have a plan that I believe will work. Uh, and when I get all the data in, in, the right, uh, in the right order and so forth, I will, I will set about to write the third volume, which doesn't exist, of Alice um, in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass fame mm -hmm. uh, and uh, see what happens. Uh, and it's, it's more like Emmy in the sense that it's got a database of the Lewis Carroll uh, originals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all set up. But it's, it's it, novel writing, playwriting, that kind of stuff is just incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I have found that. Art is turns out to be the easiest, just for me. And well, you can argue about whether it's any good or not, but it's turned out to be the easiest. And, and, uh, and music in between. And uh, so you've written, uh, well, I guess you have coded a program to do uh, haiku in particular. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so where, where did that sort of start? Did you like uh, go back and look at some of the other attempts to do that, like uh, Ractor? and so forth, or where did that, what was the genesis? Well, I just wanted to do it, I, I, that's all. I have no other excuse for it, except that I've always liked haiku. And I guess it's because when you look at a haiku, it's something, most haiku, most good haiku are pretty uh, ruthless with you. With you. They, <laughs> they're problematic to understand, they, they really are. And uh, to a degree, that's, that's the point. Um, and so I figured I was, I was, you know, even if I failed, I was going to succeed in some way. So that was, that was fun. So that was the reason why I suppose I did it first. Uh, I've done sonnets since, some of which are machine composed or created. Uh, I shouldn't say it that way because it's a tool. So we should go back and say I use my tool to produce some of these. Uh, but the, one, the, the thing you're referring to is a book that's published, that's called um, From the Fiery Night, I believe, or something. Mm -hmm. It sells quite amazingly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is just uh, staggering to me that so many people want to read this. And I still get, I still get, I mean, I invite people in the uh, preface to the book to send me their guesses as to which one or which. And I've received, you know, 2,000 answers. And I have to go through, I go through them like I'm grading a paper from one of the classes I no longer teach. And, and uh, it's funny, uh, you know, I'll be, I, I feel badly about the way in which I advertise the book. I said some of these are composed or created, written by a computer and some are written, composed by 
famous Japanese haiku poets. Now, if you want, you can make guesses as to which is which and send them to me and I will grade them and send them back to you so you can see how well you did. But for some reason that translated with a lot of readers into there's roughly an equal amount of this and an equal amount of that because that's how they produce their 2,000 guesses. Mm -hmm. But it isn't that way at all. There's only 39 mm -hmm. haikus by human beings and all the rest of them wow. are, you know, uh, produced, I'll say, by computer. I'm getting back to that tool business at the very beginning uh, that we, we spoke about. Yeah. And so is, uh, when, have you noticed the, sort of the trend now that people are doing computer generated things like, uh, is it Sunstroke, I think, or Sunflower? It's a, there's a whole bunch of like, short films that are having their scripts generated, if you knew anything about that. Yeah, I, I know about it. I mean, I don't know, I mean, I know of it, not about it. I, I can't tell you how it works or not. But short, it's, it's pretty obvious. Short things and very short things like haiku are very, um, are, are generally much easier to do than the rest. I mean, I, the, the, the haiku code is about, you know, it's on one page, you can just print it out. I mean, it's nothing. I mean, it's really nothing. People imagine it's some, but you know, you don't have to worry about character names being consistent. You don't have to worry about whether it's day or night and, and have all these memories and all this stuff following you along. So there's a certain kind of consistency there and there's a plot and there's all this stuff going on in a short story or a novel. But in the case of uh, something as, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's simple and I'm not certainly not downgrading a haiku because I love it, but it's it's not the same. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And you can much you can really create faux uh, haiku uh, and fool people with it. Mm. So much easier than than doing something like even a very short short story, which is extraordinarily complex. You just wouldn't believe how complex it is. Yeah, and uh, so. I had a question, and it was going to be a follow-up, and it's gone. And let's. Oh, uh, have you done it in Japanese at all? No. I guess it could be, but then I wouldn't understand it, nor would uh, you know, probably the readers. So, but uh, I have a number of my books uh, on other subjects published in Japanese. I, th yeah. So I they, uh, yeah, just looking looking at one yesterday. As a matter of fact, and I couldn't read the first line, so I just don't know. I'd have to learn Japanese, I suppose. Yeah, well, you've got some time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the last set is sort of the long view questions. And so the first one is, what do you think the long-term impact of computer-generated music on the, uh, the art music world as a whole will be? I, you know, I can imagine that certain professions where money is involved, it might have consequences. Film music, you know, music for documentaries, music, it's already being done for, uh, for music for homemade films, etc. So you have a film, filmic uh, score for it uh, for very little money. but. And compared to having to write, you know, and get somebody to come out and score it for you, of uh, their own music would be quite a bit more expensive. It might have some. Otherwise, I don't see a problem. I mean, people keep saying to me, "You're going to put all these composers out of work." No, it's not going to happen at all. I mean, after all, I mean, you know, essentially, um, it's a both and. It's not a neither or situation. Not neither or either or <laughs> situation. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's really a both and. I mean, really, if, if you like one or the other, then choose one or the other, and they're not gonna go away. I think people will probably end up liking or they'll have a vestige of their, their love of the music uh, written by people who they think 
have similar kinds of emotive uh, and mental images of what they're doing and why they're writing the piece. Uh, and th this is true of visual arts. I mean, is, 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 is a sunset, a, a photograph of a sunset is, is who, who made that? I mean, we're going to attribute it to God or to uh, the planets and, and uh, the sun and, and, and uh, some kind of uh, random occurrence or something. We're going um, we're gonna to give the camera credit for it. Uh, but yet we all love photographs, I mean, of, of things, uh, whether abstract or representational. Uh, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I just don't see a, a problem. I, I guess I'm just naive, according to the rest of the world, but I don't care. I try to think through things myself and make my own decisions rather than, you know, going along with the uh, crowd. And so the last one is, how long do you think before we get to the point where a computer is being used for sort of the majority of literary output? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah I'm not a futurist, and I have no idea how long that might, might take. I mean, it, I mean, what we're really talking about is, you know, when will the first alive computer exist? It will, I know, if we're allowed to... I mean, if, if current situations allow us to survive the planet Earth and the rest of the human race, then, then I, I'm quite convinced it will, it will occur. I, I tend to be somebody who's more attracted to the I am a computer kind of future. Mm -hmm. That is, we are uh, going to start putting more and more pieces of the planted into our brains and into our teeth and into our whatever. I mean, God knows when I was young, nobody wandered around looking, wondering, was that real? Is that really your hair? Is that really your teeth? Teeth are supposed to be alive, at least the roots are. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really your teeth? Or did you that? They're too bright to match your, hey, I don't know. You know, so that didn't happen much then. But it happens now quite frequently. <laughs> we wonder these things. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, that's wonderful. We're also doing, I mean, if you keep up with, uh, with uh, you know, DNA, uh, well, what do you call it when you, oh, grafting. Mm -hmm. DNA grafting and DNA, uh, we, are, we are right on the edge, literally, in the next 50 years of, of uh, of being able to live for a very long time, uh, granting that no car runs you down or something else happens, because we can actually change our bodies from growing in certain ways. And I've been keeping up with that because I've written a series of books um, about you know, artificial life and that, and, and it has taught me a lot because I've had to do a lot of research. And there are, there are companies out there doing all manner of things. Uh, I think most diseases on this planet are, are, are doomed in a fairly short time. And by that, I mean, again, 50 years. But uh, it may be faster than that because things seem to keep doubling. Moore's law for human beings, I guess, you know, in a way. Uh, but as I usually say, it's all good. I mean, if we can just leave our scientists be and, and uh, you know, put laws down, ethical laws, in a certain way that, that you know, prohibits certain people from using them indiscreetly, I think we have an, you know, an incredible future where we'll start living on 150 years, 200 years because of this and maybe sometime forever. I don't know. But I certainly know that, you know, Darwin had a great, you know, had a great idea, and evolution is is uh, an absolute of the universe, not just uh, living things, but dead things too. Evolution happens, and it looks like we believe that so much that we're we're trying to uh, get a get a good grip on it. 
and use it for our own means. And we've already done that, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's going to be a, uh, a wonder ride. I'm sorry I'm going to miss it. Uh, unless they start doing something really quick. <laughs> you know, not that I'm, 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 I know that I'm going to die or anything. I don't. Well, yes, I do. And I know it like everybody <laughs> else does. We're going to die. <laughs> We're going to die. But uh, yes, it's true. But I would, I would love to have some of this available to me so I don't know. I, you know <laughs> uh, I've already had cancer. I don't want it again. Thank you very yeah. much. You know, okay. kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great time. I wish we could have time to, uh, to enjoy it more and to stop seeing this silliness by which human beings uh, operate their lives and our own lives. <laughs>